Good morning, everybody. Woo. What a sweet time of singing together and worshiping and the mountains part where Jesus moves mountains. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, I was, a, I was a, you know, he, he said, if you say to this mountain, you can be thrown into the sea. Uh, that was a, amazing to everybody who heard that. But Jesus, like, created the mountains. He put them there in the first place. So moving mountains was like, I moved a lot of mountains in my time. You know, mountain here, mountain range. <laughs> So Jesus saying, you can move a mountain, is like, come on, that's not that big a deal. (laughs) Well, it is to us. Okay, I get it. And and we're talking about mountains and change today. And I want you to know that uh, there's mercy in our time of transition for us. God wants us to thrive in transition. See, you know, I grew up in church where you heard this all the time, and I'm sure you heard it too. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And everybody, yes. Amen. Jesus is, we're not. <laughs> he never changes, oh, we're supposed to. Okay? We're supposed to adjust, and we're so opposed to evolution, we don't want anything to change ever. You know, we're just like, no, it's not, it's not, I'm going to evolve. No, I'm not going to change. <laughs> and we're still, you know, opposed to it. I'm not saying it. But the fact is that G- Jesus, oh, he's all about change. So if you don't want to change, you're in the wrong religion. (laughs) Because Jesus wants us to change. He is, that's who he is. He is at the wedding, and he changed water to wine. And again, we think, you know, that's pretty great. Okay, so we started the church in Monmouth a few years ago, 2001. And we we restarted one in McMinnville. And they had the... The parking lot blocked off with cables, and they were boycotting the pub across the street because they served alcohol in the pub. So they were boycotting it and chained their parking lot so nobody from the nobody from the pub would park there, and (laughs) kind of sent the wrong message. Uh, (laughs) So I had to preach one of my early sermons on on wine. How important it is <laughs> to know how Jesus made it. He made it instantly. This is the biggest deal. He made the best wine instantly, which takes years of time. So Jesus took the water and changed it instantly. And so he I think he proved that he can create something old instantly. So, no big deal about the creation story of being the old earth. (laughs) Yeah, maybe. Jesus created it. (laughs) He can move mountains. Not in my sermon. (laughs) Change, though, is, here's the deal. Transition is hard. Changing is hard. Um, We have the Holy Spirit to help us with this. This is not something we're on our own about. God is with us in change. And we're going to look in 1 Samuel chapter 18, the story of Saul, Jonathan, and David. I'm going to talk about three people today. And there's a little bit of each of us in all three of these guys. And I hope, hope it will help you. If, um, let's just read 1 Samuel. If you'll turn with me, if you have a Bible or a phone, turn with me to 1 Samuel 18. And we're going to read uh, just the first nine verses. Because here's the, here's the deal. David was now anointed to be king by Samuel. He had slayed Goliath. Uh, everybody was celebrating what a great guy David was. And Saul, the anointing, had left him because of his sinful ways. And he was uh, a leader in name only. He was just there. And he was in a tough spot. And so here he is now. In, and then Jonathan is Saul's son who is caught in the middle between David, his best friend, and his dad, who is a complete, out-of-control, crazy person. All right. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. 
And, Saul, and Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing. He gave it to David along with his tunic, even his sword and his bow and his belt. Whatever he had, you know, he just, I'm yours, man. I'm, we're together. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. And this pleased the troops. And by the way, I don't think Saul just gave it to him. I think he had no choice. The tide of public opinion was shifting so strongly from Saul to now David. Um, verse 6. And when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women... Came out, the women came out of all the towns of Israel and to meet King Saul with singing and dancing and joyful songs and timbrel. And they danced and sang this number one hit right now at that, that time. Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. This didn't go over well with Saul. Saul was angry, verse 8, and this refrain displeased him greatly. Some songs do drive you crazy, but this... This was uh, deep. They've credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me only thousands. What more can he get? Oh, boy. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. He was filling it away. What more is he going to get but my job? Can I just tell you somebody's going to get your job someday? Get over it. It's going to happen. I thought I said at the beginning that God never changes, but we must. Because change is coming, and we're on this conveyor belt of change. <laughs> and it's, it's going to happen. Now, this was causing some stress. Uh, and I want to just share with you a little bit about uh, being in the middle of transition and being in the middle of this time of change. And what... What we can do about it and how, how this can help. Because I, I, a couple of things. First of all, transition is for sure. It's happening now for you. And if it's not, it will. Secondly, Jesus is with us. And he has promised his Holy Spirit to help us with all these things. Okay? So we're not left alone. First of all, I just want to tell, talk to you about Saul. Um, he resisted change. He resisted it. Now... Uh, and he got super insecure. Being insecure is not a sin, but sin will make you insecure. Okay? It's, it's not a sin to be insecure. I mean, everybody is from time to time. I, I mean, went through seventh grade. I mean, it's tough. <laughs> you know? Does anybody like me here? You know, it's, it's a tough time. And, and your first day on the job, you know, that's awkward and hard. There's, there's times when we're... We're going through this and we become insecure. So insecurity isn't a sin, but sin will make you insecure. You tell a lie, you're going to have to figure out how you're going to cover that one. You start cheating or start compromising, you're going to have to start covering. And, and Well, Adam and Eve were completely secure with God. They were completely walking with him and being a part of him. Then sin entered the situation, and they hid and covered and tried to control the situation. And they were insecure. They were hiding from God. God came looking for them. Where are you at, guys? And we're, we're naked. Who told you? Well, we're insecure now. See? Sin will make you that way. And this is what was going on with Saul. He was insecure because he was compromising over and over his calling, his anointing as king that God had placed on him. He was all of a sudden about himself. He was insecurity will take you out if you don't deal with it. And I just want to hope you, if you are struggling with some insecurity in some situations... It's hard to be friends with an insecure person. It's hard to be married to an insecure person. It's hard to work for an insecure person. Get comfortable. Jesus is with us. The comforter has come. And he will comfort you and make you secure. If you walk away from that, then you're, I'm just telling you, it's, it's tougher. You know, change is, change is to be embraced, and it's hard to embrace it. Uh, now, we love it when spring gets here, right? Uh, we, were, we spent a lot of time in Montana, north central Montana, where the cold air masses would come out of Canada 
the Arctic Express would come over and just kind of sit over us for weeks at a time. One time we were three weeks being below zero, and everybody was just going crazy. And it, one night it was 48 below zero. It froze the frost drill to the ground so deep that it froze the natural gas connection into town, and we made it on CNN because natural gas doesn't freeze. But it... It froze the gas coming into our town, so people were not able to, and so everybody was opening their ovens and turning their electric ovens on and trying to warm their house, and so we started to have a brownout. So we're in the middle of the night, and they called the pastors, because that's how we do in small communities. They called the pastors, tell your people, to, it's, we're in danger of losing all, don't run any electricity, and then they appointed me to be the guy who ran through the town and unplugged head bolt heaters. In everybody's car. <laughs> so I was frolicking through the town, pulling, pull, pull, pulling those things off. Didn't even ask. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, it was so cold for so long. It warmed up to 20 degrees above zero. Everybody was just shedding their coats. They had no, you know, this shirt sleeve weather. They walked out. It was just like everybody was just like, it's still like super cold. But it was the difference between the two that just, and you know how that goes. And change, change is so exciting to be embraced and, and when it's winter to spring. Sometimes it's difficult to go from fall to winter. Now my wife, though, she says, I love it when it gets dark early. I, I love to make soup when it's, when it's cold. You know, it's, you know, it's all cozy. And, and she's got the healthy attitude that I don't have about winter. And see, but just transition and this, here's the deal about God. He, he has created this whole thing with seasons so that we... We have a change coming no matter what. All right? Your life has change coming. You're probably in the middle of it. But it's happening. Now, I was, we had a leadership meeting at our church. We have a family of churches. And they're like, we were having a meeting and at the end of the meeting, I was trying to figure out, okay, we got to have like local pastors in all these churches because I, I can't be local in all of them. We have to have a local pastor at each church. And it was like, and I, I came out of that meeting and I mentioned to Matt, my, one of our pastors in the, in the town of Monmouth, I, I said to Matt, I says, man, I said, it feels like we're in transition. And <laughs> he goes, hey, when haven't we been in transition? <laughs> And it was a great, great answer, because always, just the problem is we sometimes don't know it and don't embrace it. Well, Saul, Saul was resisting it. He didn't want it, because he was, his security was in his position. His security when it was in his job and in his comfort zone, in his place where he was at. He could boss people around, and he was, the, he was you know, the king. But God had lifted his anointing on him and wanted something new to come, and he was resisting that. See? And he was severely insecure because of the sin. Um, that's, that's Saul, and we have sometimes problems with that. But let's talk about Jonathan. Jonathan, what an amazing guy. He, he gave him everything. He gave him his, his tunic, everything. Does that sound familiar? Jesus said if somebody asked your shirt, give him your your coat, was it, no, coat and then shirt also, whatever, tunic, whatever you got, give it, and, and Jonathan was, it was his committed friend in the middle of everything, Saul, I mean, this country is in, in, in upheaval, Saul was king in name only, David was the popular guy, obviously to everyone that he was supposed to be the king, because they were all singing songs about it, Jonathan is Saul's son, and David's friend, he's stuck in the middle. And God will place you in the midst of people in transition all the time. And it's very critical that you and I, as followers of Jesus, 
try to see things spiritually and not just see the, the hard transition, but see what God is up to here. And be a Jonathan in someone's life and talk to them and say, hey, it's going to be okay. I'm here with you. I'm committed to you. You got kids in transition? Commit to them. Just let them know you know. Okay? You got parents in transition? You let them know that you get it. Then we have a, a cool guy in our church in Monmouth. His name is Larry. Larry Phillips. He was a coach, uh, track coach. And uh, he was good friends with Bill Bowerman, a track coach from U of O. And uh, who lived out here in Central Oregon until he passed. And it was a... He's just a coach, a wonderful guy, but he's 80 years old, and he's just he's starting to have some trouble physically. And he, I went to visit him uh, a couple of days ago in his house, and he said, well, pastor, I have to sell my house, and I'm going to move to a rest home. And I just like, oh, Larry, I'm, I'm sorry. He says, no, no, no. It's okay. I, need, I just need some help, and I need some care, and I can't. He lives in a house with stairs to his bedroom. That's all he's got. He, he can't hardly walk on the level, and he's trying to go up stairs. And he said, he said, I think I can be a blessing in the rest home. Ooh. I don't know if I can say that. But see... If you find yourself in transition and you find yourself in the midst of transition, how can I be a blessing is basic Jesus 101. How can I help somebody in the midst of transition? I mean, you're, you're going to be finding yourself with people whose lives are just coming apart and they're, they're in the midst of this upheaval and this storm. Maybe you're in the middle of that storm and... Even if you're like Larry, who has to go and make a big transition, adjustment in his life, he's shifted and saying, hey, how can I be? He's very much like Jonathan in this situation. How can I be a blessing to someone else? Because every, you know what? Everybody who has to land in the rest home has had to go through this transition. Larry is on a mission to bless them. Whoa, that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. Be a blessing. See, the level you trust Jesus, uh, I don't mean this to sound legalistic, but it's just, a, it's just a principle. My principles are things that are just true. The level you trust Jesus will be the level that you successfully transition to the next place. You got to trust him. So I'm in the hot tub in my 80, he's 80 now, but... He, Five years ago, he was only 75, my father-in-law. We're in the hot tub, and I'm, six, I'm 61 now. I was, huh, how did that happen? I was 55. <laughs> he gets in the hot tub, and he's just sitting there. People talk when they're in the hot tub. They just open up. <laughs> he looked at me. He said, Jose. Ten years from now, what are you going to be doing? You'll be 65. And I got defensive and insecure, like some half times people do. And I said, well, you're 75. You're going to be 85. What are you going to do? <laughs> He's going to look better than I do. I know that in the hot tub. <laughs> but he said this to me. He said, it uh, doesn't matter. What do you mean it doesn't matter? He said, it doesn't matter. I have had everything in life that I've ever wanted come to. I have, I have my family, I have my kids, I have, my, I have this amazing life going on. From, from here, everything else is gravy. It's just a gravy. I want to get there. I'm not sure I'm there yet, but I want to get there. I want to be in a place of rest and trust in Jesus. Because if we are, we will be an amazing blessing to those around us. And if we are still in seventh grade trying to struggle with who we are and how we're dealing with it, it's going to be tough for us to be used of God the way we could be. I didn't mean to pick on seventh graders. I just, there's just times in life where it's difficult. 
And if we're always concentrating on that. Third guy here is David. I want to talk about David now. Jonathan loved in the transition. Saul resisted it. Jonathan loved. David waited. How many love waiting? <laughs> Didn't think so. Uh, it's tough to wait. It's tough. Uh, David was anointed king. Fifteen years later, he actually became the king. We think that's a long time. It is. And, and God, though, remember when we tar started talking about Jesus turning water into wine and time is like not a big deal to him. It's like mountains, boof, go. Time isn't a, 15 years was preparation time for David. Hey, there were some things. He wasn't ready to be the successful king he was until he was there. Now, waiting is hard. Lila and I were... Uh, farming before we became pastors we farmed in north central montana and it was a good life um lila entered the farming life thinking we should be in ministry and and i because we went from bible school to farming and i said to her i said really honestly i'm better off just being a farmer and blessing a church because i i really believe ministry happens uh with everyone i don't think there's this like pastor and everybody else. I think we're all together in this ministry, okay? Like I said before when I was here, there's a lot of undocumented pastors that are just pastoring without credentials. Oh, no. And so they're, you know, they're loving people and lead them to Christ and discipling, and I want you to be that. I want, so I had this going on inside of me. It's like, I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to, like, you know, get all pastoral in my, <laughs> the way I talked and stuff. You know, I still kind of resist that, but here, here's what happens. Uh, we were farming, and about six years into it, Lila said to me in the car, you know, I, I think I'm okay being a, pa a farmer. I think this is great. I, I love this life, and we're making a difference in our church and our community, and I think this is ministry, and so I'm good with this. As soon as she said that, something went off inside of me, like, okay, time to, to change from farming to pasturing. You know, you just finally get your wife, you know, all in a nice spot there, and you're comfortable, and then she says she is, and it's like God dealt with me. So it's time for you to pastor. I don't want to do that, pastoring. You know. Well, the when I said yes to that and I talked to Lila and then we had this time where, okay, we realized we're supposed to do this. I got all credentialed <laughs> legal, legally <laughs> and, and I got credentialed and we, I said, okay, I'm going to stop farming and I'm going to make a resume. Have you ever made a resume, Jordan? That's why I like you, buddy. <laughs> I'm just going to become clean with you. I made a resume, a pastoral resume. Because I needed a job. If I was going to be a pastor, I had to have a church. So I sent a resume, a picture of my beautiful wife and my two little kids. And it was just, I sent this with a philosophy of ministry, what I believe in, all the stuff that I feel good about. And uh, mostly self-promoting everything I was. <laughs> and I put it on this nice, I, I made it in a nice presentation. I, I sent 60 of them across the Northwest. You know how many people I had, I was just waiting for the phone to ring and get a bunch of, you know, interviews, and I, they were probably going to get in a bidding war over me, and, <laughs> and I thought that was going to happen. <laughs> it didn't. Not one interview. Not one phone call, like, thanks for your resume, we're going to put it in here and just talk about it and pray about it. Not one, not one thing. I know. <laughs> we ended up planting our own church because I, you know, I'll show them. <laughs> well, 
Uh, I'm, you know, right that night we got credentialed, the, the speaker wheeled around, and there was about a thousand people in the room, and he pointed at me, and he said, Joe, if God has called you, he'll have a place for you. And I was like thinking the phone was going to ring Monday, and it didn't happen. Three more years went by. And I think like, I know a lot of you think three years, like, pfft, that's nothing. We had a lady give a testimony about her son coming to Jesus. She had been praying for him for 52 years. She was super old, and he was old now too, but I'm just telling you, time isn't a big deal for God as it is to us. And we have to get to that place of waiting. David waited. And he waited for what God had for him, and he was, don't waste the wait. Don't be all like, oh, no, I can't. In those three years of Lila and I waiting, God moved, changed, adjusted, strengthened, called us, and prepared us for what we were supposed to do. David had to wait. And when you wait, don't waste it. Waiting is, I have a little routine before I preach on Sunday mornings. I go down to a restaurant and have a little one egg and hash browns because I like everything the same all the time. I should have been a baseball player. I just, I'm not superstitious. I just like stuff the same, you know? <laughs> so I went, and uh, this morning, and the waitress came and, and said, what can you get you? I said, I'll have an egg and hash browns and put an egg on top of the hash browns. Crispy. <laughs> sounds pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> well... And then I just get go over my sermon stuff so I don't have to like be. Anyway. She was a waitress. The, the word waitress means she waits on me. She's not standing behind the counter wondering. She comes and waits and serves. Waiting is a waiting. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. It's not unhooking from the Lord. It's serving him. With your time and your present tense situation. I'm going to wait on the Lord actively. I'm going to find out what he's saying to me. And you're in a transition. You, you just think, oh, when's it going to happen for me? When's it going to take place? Wait on the Lord. Get present tense with Jesus. And let's serve him and trust him and wait on him. See, that's, that's what produces the miracle and at the end of the waiting time, God just brings you into the time, and you're just like, whoa, this is what he wanted. Transitions are hard, and they're difficult. And there's no, there's no getting around it. If it was easy, we, would, we wouldn't be human. But because we are, Jesus has come, and he's given us the comforter. So that when we are going through it, we don't have to be insecure like Saul. We can be loving and aware of others like Jonathan and just serve. And, and we can be like David and wait on the Lord and just say, God, I know you're in this. I know that you have called me. I know you have placed your hand on me. There's an anointing on my life. I just don't see how it's going yet. I don't see where it's at yet. But I'm going to wait on you and serve him. Yeah, that's... This is easier said than preached. I mean, preached than done. Said than done. It's easy to talk about, hard to do. <laughs> that's why we have the Lord, and that's why we have the Holy Spirit to help us with that. Uh, let's just pray as we, as we get ready to wrap this up. Is there's, there's folks here, I'm sure. We're all in transition. But sometimes it gets really difficult, and I just want to pray that the Holy Spirit will give you some some strength, some direction. I want us to wait on the Lord here right now and just serve him at the present time we have. So Jesus, first of all, we want to embrace the transition things and the, the, because we know that if we don't change, we die. And so we know that because you've called us to life and you've called us to to serve, we know that you're unchanging and we're not. So we come and we line up with you. And in that process, there's many transitions. 
So I pray, Lord, for those who are going through a difficult thing, that your Holy Spirit would come and comfort them and lead them, encourage them. Would you take our insecurities, God, replace them with faith and confidence in you. In your name we pray.